Well, it, it's a privilege now just to introduce Dr. Jim Caseman to you. Um, Brother Jim, yesterday, before you shared, James Johnson Hill and I were on together, and uh, we were sharing about, you know, that the topic was contending for unity, and we got into some of the discussions about the things that divide us, the things that are challenging in the culture right now, and uh, trying to address some of the issues that might be even in the church, our churches, and how we can bring understanding to each other and uh, educate uh, maybe each other about the things that would hurt and divide. But we only had 45 minutes. We didn't get to this part of the conversation that you were sharing on uh, about holiness and about abiding in God's covenant. And it's the other piece that um, knowing who we are in Christ is, is central to growing up and to not staying in our past and not let anybody's hate define us or anybody's prejudice define us. But that we'd, we'd, we'd be defined by the word of God and who he says we are. And so I, I just appreciated what you were sharing. You were even getting some preach on there about the power of the Holy Spirit and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I greatly appreciate through the years, you're reminding us of this new covenant, who we are in this new covenant. It's not who men say we are, but it's who God says we are. And it's not what men can give to us, but it's what Jesus already gave to us and to abide in those things. So thanks again. And I'm going to turn it over to you. It's a privilege to be under the word this morning. All right. Well, uh, appreciate that, Mike. And um, yesterday we talked about holiness and uh, righteousness, made reference to the new blood covenant. What I want to do this morning, a uh, topic is blood covenant. And before you turn it off <laughs> and walk away, you can say all that Jim Caseman ever talks about is blood covenant. Well, when we look at our Bible, like I said yesterday, it's Old Covenant and it's New Covenant. I know we call it New Testament, Old Testament, but another way to put it, or more accurately, really, is Old Covenant and New Covenant. Now, when we look at the Old Covenant, and we need to take the whole Bible when we're talking about redemption, if we're going to understand redemption, we need to take the whole Bible, because the Old Covenant it all contains messianic prophecies, and depending on what uh, source that you use, there's at least over 300 messianic prophecies that talk about Jesus in the Old Covenant. And of course, all of these, all of the Old Covenant is preparation for the promise. And that, of course, the promise is the New Covenant, where Jesus comes and he fulfills everything that was ever said about him under the Old Covenant. He fulfills it under in through the new blood covenant. Now, under the new blood covenant, we receive the fulfillment of everything that was prophesied about Jesus in the old covenant. And we then not only receive, but we receive that fulfillment and possess it to where you and I then can walk in it and apply uh, the word of God to our lives. I'd like to read uh, Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now, the reason, another reason again why I want to remind everybody about the new blood covenant is there is so much turmoil in this world right now with the pandemic and with all of the lawlessness and, and the finances and everything. I mean, there's just all kinds of things going on. And if we're not careful, if all we're doing is watching the news, for example, we can be distracted. Now, I'm not against watching the news. I, I'm, I'm more of a headline guy because I don't have much time to watch it, but I do like to see what the headlines are. But we can't, we can't afford to have the things that are going on in the world to take away all of our time where we used to pray or study the word. And... Uh, God has got to be first. He's got to be central in our lives. We've got to be conscious of the fact that we have a blood covenant with him. And through that new blood covenant, it doesn't make any difference. What's going on in the world? God's already made provision for us with infinite protection and provision through the new blood covenant. And God, the things, like I said yesterday, the things of the spirit is where reality is. Not the things that are in this world. The Bible makes it very clear that God is a spirit and he created everything. So it's the spiritual realm that created this physical realm. And the things of the spirit are eternal. 
they never cease to exist. But the Bible's clear. The things in this physical dimension are temporary. Two easy example. One easy example is when one when somebody uh, their body stops breathing and they die, and uh, we go to the funeral home or whatever or where wherever or in the hospital. You touch the body; it's like ice cold and stiff. And and you don't even have to be a Christian. You've never read the Bible, but you know, whoever that was is gone, but they don't know where. And uh, and the same with the earth. Second Peter again, and and chapter three and the verse ten to thirteen talks about the earth and the universe consumed in fire, just melting away. And that means every trace of sin is gone. The physical dimension, the physical universe is gone, temporary. And then there's a new earth and a new heaven that is eternal. And it's not a physical one either, because it is a, it is a heaven and an earth that will work with our glorified body. So it's a, a glorified world, if you will. It's not a physical dimension like it was when we had this flesh. We, we don't, we're not clothed in flesh anymore. We're clothed with, a, with a, the same body that Jesus had when he was resurrected, the glorified body. He didn't even have to open the doors to come in to where the disciples were. Those doors were locked. He just walked right through. And so the point is, this physical dimension is temporary. Let's not let this temporary thing take us away from God. All right, now in order to deal with these things in the physical dimension, we better be covenant people. We better understand that we have a covenant with God. Now, the purpose of this next few minutes then is to emphasize how important this blood covenant is and help us to see how supernatural it is and how supernatural this inspired Bible, it's inspired. God's the only one that can write this book. It's not outdated. It's gotta be somebody that knows what's gonna happen several, year, several thousand years down the road. And those 300 Messianic prophecies were written by one who knew what would happen 4,000 years later. No human being could do that. So this is the final authority. And so those are some of the things that we wanna get across this few minutes that we have. This is the ultimate authority for everything that we do. It's not outdated. It's not an old book. It's current. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, forever, today, and forever. Okay, so let, let's get started. So <clears throat> we come back, and we need to understand that God only works with men or mankind with blood. And the previous sessions uh, with, well, uh, Mary Ann Berry made a real, in one of her illustrations, she talked about the blood of Jesus and God only works with blood when he works with men and we see the seed form of that in Genesis 3:21 after Adam had sinned separated from God and uh, we see then in in that verse that God man had clothed himself with fig leaves but God then clothed them with the skin of an animal so that was the first time they saw death but there was blood that was shed innocent blood Animals can't sin. Innocent blood was shed to clothe them with those hides. So that's just in seed form. Later on in Leviticus, under the law, under types and shadows, we see that when the blood of an animal was shed to cover man's sins, the skin was given to the priest as as a uh, uh, that, that that they would know that there was blood shed as evidence rather that there was blood shed to cover man's sins. All right. And so then we come along with Abraham. And now Satan then went ahead and he, can, he got through the man's flesh. He was able to take man captive and be separated from God. And so the only way that God can redeem mankind, he's going to have to do it through the flesh. And that's why we see in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word was made flesh. Jesus had to come into the flesh, literally as a human being in every respect, in order to redeem mankind legally, because Satan hijacked the human race through the flesh. All right, so right from the beginning then, Genesis 3.21, we see the seed of it. The seed of what? God's plan to redeem mankind. And so God's got that in his mind all the way from Genesis to the, to the end of the book of Revelation. Redemption, 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 redemption. All right, so it's got to start somewhere. 
So it starts there in Genesis 3, 21. We see even after the Noahic flood, we see that Noah offered up an offering with blood, and we see that all the way to Mount Sinai and all the way through. But then here's this covenant that God made. So first of all, he promises Abram something. He finally finds a man. He's got to have a human being, a sinless human being, that he can enter into covenant with in order to redeem mankind. And so we see Abram. And, then to, and he told Abram and in Genesis 12, the first three verses, to get out of your country from your family, from your father's house, to a land. All right, now he's promised him three things. Here's land. And I'll make you a great nation, number two. And you'll be a name of great, shall be a blessing, and I bless those who bless you, and curse will bless you. And in you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Three things. And of course, first of all, we see land. Well, ultimately, he's talking about Hebrews eleven sixteen, where the patriarchs were looking forward to that heavenly land, that heavenly country, a great nation. Well, ultimately, what is he's looking forward to is under the new blood covenant in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, we see that we, we would become, as born-again believers, we'd become a, a, a royal priesthood and a great nation. He's looking forward to that spiritual kingdom he's going to build, the spiritual kingdom, the nation of God, the kingdom of God that we ultimately would become citizens of when we're born again. And then thirdly, and you all the families of earth shall be blessed. Well, Abraham, the blessing of Abraham, according to Acts 3, 25, 26, is the forgiveness of sins for all nations and families of this earth. So those are the three promises. Well, then we come over to Genesis chapter 15, and beginning with verse 1 all the way through verse uh, 6, Again, he repeats these three promises, land, a great nation, and of course, uh, um, uh, the blessing to all nations and families. But now you've got to understand that Abraham's not born again. He, he still hasn't got a real clue of what's going on, except that the Hebrew men, God taught them how to cut covenant, blood covenant. And of course, uh, uh, pagan nations, you know, they, they cut covenant too. All the devil can't create anything. So when God showed the Hebrews how to cut covenant, well, then the devil comes along and perverts everything that God does. And so he perverted blood covenant. But when God cut covenant, the Hebrew men, uh, it was between him and God. So here, when Abram says, well, how will I know? Well, of course, first of all, it says, and he believed in the Lord and he, and he accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham was real sensitive in the sense that he, he believed God, he trusted him, and of course we know in, Je in Galatians 3, verse 8, it was accounted, uh, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. In other words, he was saved because he believed in what God was going to do. And of course that ultimately was God was going to send his son to pay the death penalty for our sins. And so it was accounted him for righteousness. Now, Abraham, of course, he's not born again. This is still the old covenant. And so he's thinking in the natural, and he says, well, how will I know I'm going to get the land? Well, God then immediately says, I want you to bring, and he listed all the animals and the birds and everything that he was to bring to him. Well, as soon as God told Abram to bring those animals to them, he knew immediately what was about to take place. God was going to cut a covenant with him, a blood covenant. And of course, then he had took the larger animals, the birds they didn't cut in half, but the larger animals, they would cut them in half. And they tilt the halves kind of like a V-shape, so the blood would run in the middle. And then, if this was two Hebrew men, they both would stand in the middle of that blood, back to back. And then they'd start walking, and they'd make a figure eight pattern, and they'd end up facing each other. And, of course, that figure eight, that's eight, eight, eight. The number eight stands for a new beginning. And it isn't an interesting that out of all the blood covenants, that God had, or the covenants that he mentions, there's eight of them, and the eighth one is the new blood covenant, a new beginning. All right, and the covenant with Abraham, of course, being the first one. All right, so then, we see that they, they get it all set up, and then the vultures come, and of course, the vultures represent the devil, and of course, the devil's trying to, to mess up this whole thing, and of course, Abraham's trying to scare him away, 
But then uh, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Well, Abram was laid aside. Now, the easiest way to understand that for me is in the New Blood Covenant, there are times when the Holy Spirit will come upon people and they'll go down in, uh, uh, out under the power, we say. They're in a trance, but yet they, you can hear and see things, but you can't move, you, you, whatever. And Abraham, he's laying there. He can't do anything, but he sees what's going on. Now, uh, God could, is cutting covenant with Abram, Abram. He has to cut covenant with a human being. But now Abram, he is, has the nature of sin. Now we know that God's ultimate plan is to redeem mankind. So if he's going to cut covenant to redeem mankind, he has to cut a covenant with a sinless human being. There has to be a sinless substitute for mankind. And Abraham's not sinless. And so then, this is a foreshadowing of what God's going to do. So now we have a smoking oven going through these halves and a burning torch. Well, the burning torch or lamp is God the Son. So God the Son ultimately is going to be take on the form of a human being literally in every respect, as we all know. But it hasn't happened here yet. So God has to enter into covenant with someone uh, uh, that will uh, uh, be able to, well, how should I put it? You don't enter into blood covenant unless each party has a need. God had a need to redeem mankind. Man had a need to be redeemed. And so Jesus represents man to be redeemed. And so now he has someone that's sinless because God is holy and sinless. And sin can't come into his presence, but God the Son is sinless. And ultimately, he'll become that sinless human being. So now they enter into blood covenant with each other. So God the Son stood in for Abram. Now God needs Abram because somewhere down the road, God the Son, who takes on the form of a human, sinless human spirit, He's going to have to, he comes into this world sinless, conceived of the Holy Spirit, Luke 1, 31, 32 and on, and where he says he comes upon Eve, or Mary rather, the Virgin Mary, comes upon her and, and is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he comes, takes on the form of a sinless human being. But then he's a spirit. And then it's interesting, Hebrews 10, verse 5 says, you gave me a body. See, he needed a physical body. So Mary provided the physical body for Jesus. And that physical body had the same, it was the same, had the same sinful lusts and desires in it like your body and mine. Romans 8, 3, Hebrews 2, 14, Amplified Bible tells us that. The same flesh that we have. Okay. So then, now this is really, gets really interesting. And you can see how the Bible is so supernatural. Uh, it's not, it's not another book like any book on the earth. And we see then God's looking down the road. Because somewhere down, Way down at the end of the road, God needs a sinless sacrifice. He needs a sacrificial lamb. And so, and it's interesting because right here in the midst of all this in Hebrews chapter 15, as soon as Abraham was laid aside, then he goes on for verse 13 through 16, and God talks about the children of Israel some 400 years down the road where they would be in Egypt. And they would be afflicted for 400 years, but then they would come out with great possessions. And what was that 400 some years down the road? It was Exodus 12. It was the Passover. Now in the Passover, now on the final plague, God was going to all of the firstborn, the Pharaoh, all the firstborn of everything would, be, would die that night. But the children of Israel protected with what? The blood of a spotless lamb. And of course, they, they examined that lamb, they got that lamb out and got ready to, uh, uh, you know, cut the throat, get the blood and collect it. But before they could do that and make sure it was spotless, they watched it then on the 10th day of the month, there was the lamb, they watched it for four days. And then if there was still spotless, no bruises on it, then it could be offered up as a spotless lamb. Now that blood that they'd applied to the, the lentils of the door and everything, that when, as long as that blood was applied to the doorpost of their home, then when the angel of death came through that night, wherever he saw the blood, passed over that home, and nobody died in that home. 
Now that's a type and shadow of the final, ultimate Passover lamb years later, hundreds of years later. And here we see John the Baptist in John 1, 31. He sees Jesus coming down the road. Behold, the lamb of God that would take away the sins of mankind. Wow. No, we're back here with Abram. We're looking at several thousand years later before Jesus would show up as the Lamb of God. But even in Psalms 22, we see a, 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 a detailed description of the crucifixion a thousand years before Jesus was crucified and 250 years before crucifixion was even invented. So all down through the Old Testament, you see, we see Jesus, 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 and how this is just a shadow, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. And then finally, it starts to happen. And so then, we see that the covenant then is about to be cut now. The type and shadow. Genesis 15 is just a type and shadow of the real thing. That's a few thousand years down the road. But now the day has come. Whew! We see the incarnation was announced in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman shall bruise your head. The seed of the woman shall bruise your head. Well, Satan, it's, it's what it's saying there is that the seed of the woman, that's a supernatural birth, that's the virgin birth, that's Jesus, going to strip Satan of all power and authority and ultimately destroy him in the lake of fire forever and forever. The seed of the woman's the virgin birth. And so it was announced. Well, the day came. Jesus is born on this earth. And then at the age of 30, he then enters ministry. And now his, his ministry is launched. His goal is to fulfill the Day of Atonement. So he's on his way. And finally, it comes. Where we see the Palm Sunday. We see Zechariah talking about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. I mean, this is how detailed these messianic prophecies were. Here he comes, riding in on a donkey. Well, what's significant about that? This is the ultimate sacrifice that the priests were looking forward to for 1,500 years under the Mosaic law. Every year, the high priest would have the Day of Atonement that had to be fulfilled, where he and he alone, he couldn't be touched, had to make preparations to take blood, the blood of an animal, into the most holy place and sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the ark in order for Israel to receive forgiveness for sins, known or unknown sins, for that year. And I'm telling you, if the priest didn't do it exactly right, according to Leviticus chapter 16, he's dead. Those with some fear and trembling that he had to go, these priests had to go through this for 1,500 times, 1,500 years. And in that Day of Atonement, they always, the Day of Atonement always looked forward to the ultimate, the final lamb that would be offered up, the ultimate lamb, the Son of God. They looked, that's what they were looking forward to. Well, the lamb shows up. And now he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now, it is interesting, too, that the people... Uh, uh, in those years, you know, in earlier years, they'd all have to come in with a lamb without a bruise and without blemish. But, you know, in the travel, they could get bruised because some of them come from great distances. So they started growing the lambs or raising the lambs, rather, around Jerusalem. When people would come, they'd purchase a lamb so that they could offer it up as a sacrifice. Well, here comes the Lamb of God. Well, the high priest ultimately would be the ones that would crucify him. They needed a lamb. And they paid 30 pieces of silver for that lamb. So four days, after four days, he ends up then appearing before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate said at least twice, I remember, that I find no fault in him. In other words, he's spotless. He's without, he's a, without spot or blemish. And then, of course, now he could be offered up on the altar of the cross. All right, but that was just interesting. I, I, it was just so exciting. All right, now we're on the cross. Here we go. We're talking about blood covenant and how supernatural the word of God is and how supernatural this covenant is that we have with God. And we need to be conscious of this. 
because they're, we, you know, think of not constraining, so think, uh, concerning the fiery trials that come upon you. That's part of life on this earth with Satan, the prince of the power of the air. So what we're seeing now is really nothing new. This was all, it already has happened in the United States back in what, 91, 92, when all of LA was set on fire by, by protests and marches. And this is just another repeat of it. Nothing's changed. And there's always trials. I mean, you don't have to have protests and marches. We have trials in our personal lives and the lives of our families or what have you. That's the way it is. We're living in an unfriendly environment. Satan's the prince of the power of this physical dimension. This is not our home. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but we're missionaries. We're in this dark world. God's got to have a body in this dark world, and we're members of the body of Jesus so that he can speak to people and get them saved and, and lay hands on people and get them healed. He's got to have a physical body. He's a spirit, and we're his physical body, corporately and individually, as the body of Christ. All right, the new blood covenant now. Jesus then, in order for God's plan of redemption to be successful, he's got to have a sinless human substitute that would come into this world clothed with the same sinful flesh that we have, be willing to tempt it in all points, even as we are, yet without sin, and then would be willing to die. And upon his resurrection, sin, death, and Satan's power be destroyed. Hebrews 2.14, that through death, he, Jesus, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, so Jesus then comes to the cross sinless. He didn't violate any part of the Mosaic law, civil ceremony, moral law, the Ten Commandments. He kept everything. He did not sin. And so he's hanging on the cross sinless. And so sin, death, and Satan have no power over him at this point. All right, now Genesis 15 is fulfilled. Look at it. In Genesis 15, God the Father and God the Son are walking through those halves. Just a type and a shadow. Now God the Son has taken the form of a sinless human spirit. And here he is. We've got God the Father and Jesus, sinless human being, hanging on the cross. And now, here we have the Lamb of God slain on the cross, blood coming out of him. And that blood is running down the altar of the cross. And in the middle of that blood, God only works with blood when it comes to blood covenant. And in the middle of that blood, we have God the Father. And we have Jesus, God the Son, who is now his innocent human being. And now God can enter into covenant with the human race through Jesus. And both of them then enter into covenant, blood covenant with each other, give, and each one giving up the rights to their own life. That was just the way it was when the Hebrew men cut covenant. And as they entered into covenant, this is called the great exchange. Now, Jesus represents, will be representing mankind here shortly, but, the, but, but he is now, but he will take on our sins here shortly. And so everything that God is and ever will be becomes man's, and everything that man is and ever will be becomes God's. The great exchange. Wow. Now, God proceeds and continues with his plan of redemption. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no more sin was made sin for us. And now Jesus then takes on the sins of you, me, all of mankind. He didn't sin, but now our sins have come upon him. He's taken them upon himself. And now he dies. All right. So now according to Matthew 27, verse 50, 51, all hell breaks loose on the earth. Earthquakes. And the veil is split from the top to the bottom. And, and now the, human, the, the sinful human flesh represents the veil in the temple in Jerusalem. And that sinful human flesh is what kept mankind out of the most holy place. Only the high priest could go back there and under certain conditions. And so now that happens. And so now Jesus is dead and his body is dead. So, and, and so now his body, sinful human flesh, of the human, sinful, human, lustful desires of the flesh, that's dead. It's nailed to the cross. So now the veil can be removed. Now, we have his physical body, which is put in a physical grave, and now we have Jesus, who goes into Shoal. That's another word for hell in Hebrew. 
And shul means a grave or the dead, the abode of this dead, the spiritually dead. So Jesus then, now it says in Galatians 2.20 that we are crucified with Christ. He took our place. And as far as God's concerned, we're crucified with him on that cross. Now Jesus takes on our sins. Now he, he is dead spiritually just like we are before we're born again. But now he descends into the shoal or hell as a spirit, as the son of man, dead spiritually. And we're dead spiritually too. So as far as God's concerned, we go to hell with him. Now, when we talk about hell, the scriptures talk very clearly about it. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, even as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, some of the son of man being the heart of the earth three days and three nights, the heart of the earth is hell. Now, if you look at the prophets, he said, that whatever the prophets say about me, Luke 24, 44, I have to fulfill it. And so Jonah 1, 17, we see that, he, that uh, Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. You read all of chapter two, it's talking about a man in hell. And then it talks about Jesus at the very end of that chapter. I, he said, I, 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 will, I, I will, will vow to, you know, uh, he vowed to fulfill redemption or salvation for mankind. And then all of Psalms 88 talks about Jesus in hell. Psalm 16, verse 10 and 11 talks about Jesus in hell. Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 35, the Apostle Paul talks about Jesus. He quotes that verse, Psalm 16, verse 10 and 11, talks about Jesus in hell and his body not seeing corruption. He talks about Jesus in hell and being resurrected. So you got all kinds of scriptures. So now, God can't go to hell, but as a man, he can. God can't die, but as a man, he can. He had to take the form of a human being literally in every respect. Hallelujah. Well, he descends into hell as a son of man. And after three days and three nights, the, son, the, 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 uh, the demands of justice are met. And now, now here's where Hebrews 13, verse 20 comes into play. Now listen to this. Now, may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. See, he's in covenant with God. No, Jesus' life becomes God's life. God's life becomes Jesus' life. And he's the first to be resurrected from the dead. That means sin, death, and Satan no longer can hold him. He's resurrected. He broke the power of death and Satan. And so that means that nobody in hell could touch him. He's sinless, just like when he was. And so he also then has disarmed his belly powers. He makes a public spectacle of him because he received the name of Jesus upon his death on the cross. And the name of Jesus, every need to go and every tongue confess he's Lord. Now, he's been resurrected. So Satan's power has been broken. Now, remember now, we're resurrected with him. So Satan's power is broken on our behalf as well. So the same power that broke Satan's uh, 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 power is the same power that we have. Jesus said in Acts 1, 4, and 5, he told the disciples, now you wait. You wait. No, don't, don't you go anywhere. You're born again right now. The church has been birthed. But you wait until the promise of the, you receive the promise of the Father. And that's Pentecost, where we, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we have that unlimited power, the same power that created this universe. That means it's greater than all atomic power, nuclear energy, all of that. And the power of kings, armies, or wind, and lightning. It's, it's all of those combined. The power of God's greater than all of those. It's the same power, like I said, that created the universe. And that lives inside of every believer. So we have unlimited power and ability to enforce the victory that was won in heaven. The authority of the believer. So let's believe it. Let's not just say, I believe it. Let's do it. Oh, brother. But now here's another thing. Marianne Berry talked about it in her session. Jesus is our high priest. Now, here's another important part about blood covenant. When Jesus was resurrected, he also was resurrected as Melchizedek fulfilled. Now, you go to Genesis 14, verse 18, after Abram had won the battle, defeated the kings, he then goes and he's right before Melchizedek, king of Salem, also a high priest. And the priest blesses Abram. And Abraham gives him tithes. 
Now you read about this in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 8. Verse 7 says the greater, I believe it's chapter 7, and uh, uh, I'm not going to go there now, but it's in Hebrews chapter 7, where the, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Melchizedek, the greater, the high priest, he blesses the patriarch, Abram, Abraham. He's great. Abraham's a great man. But the priest is the greater who blesses the lesser, and then the lesser gives tithes to the greater. Now, there's only one place in the Old Testament where a man is priest king, and this is Melchizedek. He stood in the office as a priest king. No other mention throughout the whole Old Testament is talks about a priest king. But now Jesus is resurrected as the king of kings, and as Melchizedek fulfilled, he is our eternal high priest. Melchizedek's genealogy never was listed because he was a type and shadow of Jesus who has no genealogy. And now he is our eternal high priest. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father in, and, and, for, and ever interceding for us, praying for us all the time. And that's important for us to understand that if we don't understand Jesus as our high priest and why he's there and what, he's, what his duties are as mediator and bringing us near to God and helping us to fulfill everything that he's promised us through the blood covenant, if we don't understand all of that, we're going to be very deficient in our walk with God. All right. So as our high priest now, he picks up his glorified body and his glorified blood. What about the blood of Jesus? You know, the Old Testament was collected at the base of the altar and then taken into the most holy place. Jesus' blood shed at the altar of the cross, at the base of the cross. Well, nowhere so far has he been able to take it into heaven. Well, Jesus now, as our high priest, he's on his way to fulfill the Day of Atonement. This is the final sacrifice, the final Day of Atonement. It's going to be ended right here when Jesus takes his own blood into the most holy, holy places. And so he picks up his glorified body, glorified blood. He sees Mary Magdalene. Don't touch me. See, that's Leviticus 16. If the high priest would have been touched, it would have been over with. It wouldn't have worked. Don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my father, my brother, tell him, ascending my father, you're the Lord of my God, your God. She takes off, verse 18. He takes off, not with the blood of goats and calves, but he, and not with the blood of calves, but with his own blood, he enters the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So as he enters the most holy place, he sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the seat of judgment, but now he sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat, and it turns into a seat of mercy. And now mankind's sins are forgiven. He sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. Mankind's is forgiven. The debt of guilt is paid. Glory be to God. And I see also, well, here I come back here to, oh, hallelujah. Coming back here to the book of Revelation, to chapter 11, and in verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. The ark of covenant is up in heaven. He sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat, and all of man's sins are forgiven. Isn't that awesome? Whew. So he goes, the same day, Acts 20, I mean, John 20, 19, on the same day, he appears in the midst of the disciples. He breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit. They receive the indwelling spirit. Forty days later, he goes up into heaven. And, of course, uh, there's war breaks out in heaven. We, not, we don't, can't talk about that now, but Revelation 12, 7, that war broke out in heaven. Angel, uh, Satan, uh, uh, Michael and his archangels take on Satan and his angels. And then the, uh, Michael, as, uh, the, uh, Satan and, and his bunch then, Satan being the accuser of the brethren, was then cast out of heaven at the end of those ten days. Revelation 12, 8, 9, and 10. And right with it comes Pentecost. Not only was the accuser of the brethren cast down on the earth and cast out of heaven, but now God immediately sent his Pentecost. He immediately makes the baptism of the Holy Ghost available to that early church. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now they have power to enforce the victory that was already won in heaven and to take the gospel to the world. Oh, my goodness. I don't know where I'm at. I think I have a few minutes left. I don't know it. But anyway, uh, so through the new blood covenant then, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we now take on his nature, the great exchange. He's taken on our nature of sin, and now we take on that nature of holiness. And now we receive, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit through the new blood covenant. 
and we didn't have any power, now we have power. It's always the great exchange. Now, also, the Hebrew men would then, after they had walked through the halves, they would then express the covenant terms. And this is the final point that I'll close with. And the covenant terms. Now, they would then, each man, Hebrew man, would have witnesses, and they would address this congregation of witnesses. And each would take their turn. The first one would say, everything I am and ever will be and have and ever will have all belongs to you, including my family, my children, and everything. It's all yours. The other man would do the same. And if the one had a financial problem, he'd say, hey, you know, we'd say it like this today. Uh, where's our checkbook? See, everything 100% belongs to each other. Well, I already said 100% of what God is and never will be belongs to Jesus. 100% of what Jesus is and never will be belongs to, to that Jesus has belongs to God. And you and I belong to have our in blood covenant with, through, with God through Jesus Christ. So everything we are never will be in heaven, never will. It all belongs to God. 100% all spirit, soul, and body. It's all yours. And we're blessed. The greater is blessed by the lesser. I've been blessed by God with eternal life. And in exchange, I bring tithes to him. He continues to bless me as I continue to give. And so you can see the blessing and the tithes and the offerings are really tied close together. As we tithe and give offerings, he continues to bless. He blesses, we give. And that's just the way it is under the new blood covenant. They used to give tithes to men, but now we give tithes to the one whom we, not, we cannot see, the greater one, Jesus, our high priest our priest king. All right, now, so when God talks about covenant, everything is and has belongs to him, and, and, and we have to be careful now that we don't, you know, just narrow down just to one thing like money. Here's biblical prosperity, and that's what we are. I mean, everything God, he's the creator of everything, and he owns everything, and he's made everything that he is and has available to all of us, to all believers. I, just, I believe it, but not only do I believe it, I receive it, and I believe I'm walking in it. One thing is just to say it, and Pastor Roy is trying to get that across, another thing to do it. And that's the same with Mary Ann Berry. We need to do it. If we're intercessors, do it. So here's a description of biblical wealth. In the scriptures, wealth is not defined by a dollar amount of money. Now, isn't it interesting that we get into the flesh and we try to define our covenant with God and prosperity with God with money. That's the lowest form of prosperity that exists as far as God's concerned. Wealth is not defined. Spirit, scriptural wealth is not defined by a dollar amount of money. Our covenant with God does not describe the blessings of the new blood covenant are not defined by a dollar amount of money. But rather it is a certain state of abundance more than enough of god's love power joy peace health life favor all spiritual blessings and all earthly blessings to include financial abundance and or material possessions that will enable you to do what god has called or assigned you to do as your part in the body of christ in order to establish god's everlasting covenant of salvation for mankind Praise the Lord. You know, previous two speakers have talked about prayer. You know, with all of the supernatural answers to prayer and, and, and people uh, healed and, and spared from death and what have you, money never was involved in any of those things. But, the, but the, what was involved was the abundance of wisdom and knowledge and power through prayer. Now, God wants us to have money. There's no question about that because we need money to buy bread and to, to do what we do in the ministry. Definitely wants us to have abundance of everything, including Monday, money. He doesn't want us to be lacking in any area of life. He wants us to have an abundance of everything so that we can fulfill what God's called us to do. So let's take the whole load. Let's just not narrow it down to one thing. Amen. All right, so we're in blood covenant. I wanted you today, above everything, to realize how, how significant it is to be able to walk in this covenant with God. It's the answer to any need that we'd ever have in the world. It's the answer to all the protests and marches and, and rebellion and lawlessness and murder and divorce and, and sexual sin and pornography and all oh, drugs and alcohol, everything that's out there. This is the answer. Jesus is. 
And this is what we need to emphasize. This is what we need to tell people more than ever. I mean, we're here to take the good news to people, the good news to those who don't know Jesus, and the good news to the Christians who up to this point are in unbelief, don't believe God's word. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting too excited. So I want you to understand this is important. Above all things, we need to walk in God's presence 24 7, even at work. We need to pray continually, even at work. We can pray under our breath and tongues. We can occasionally, in the, in, in the natural, even declare things over certain people who come to us. We can pray without ceasing all day long and still do our job. When we say pray without ceasing all day long, it's not talking about being on your knees all day long. Because we got some, most Christians have jobs. We've got to go to work and do things. But we take God's presence with us. And it's all through the new blood covenant. It's cut with blood. And the reason that blood is so powerful is because God's life is in that blood. And that's why that blood is still alive today. Because God's life is in it. Eternal life. That powerful life that created everything. There's power in the blood because God's life is in that blood. Hallelujah. Well, I'm beginning to try. To, I'm, I'm circling now, trying to find a place to stop. So, Father, I just thank you for the covenant that we have with you. It's so supernatural. It's a supernatural covenant that we have with you through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us to understand it more fully each day, all of us, that we get the revelation of it. I thank you that your power and your ability is available. And Jesus, you are, through the Holy Spirit, giving us that power and everything that we need to walk in the fullness of it. And may revelation knowledge and spiritual understanding flow freely regarding this important subject. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm done. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That was powerful. What a great commissioning at the end and a challenge to us as uh, ministers and AFCM. And so thank you for that. Blessed to be a blessing and uh, the responsibility of uh, just sharing that covenant and enforcing that covenant and helping people walk in it. So thank you so much. Hey, could the other, the rest of us unmute and we're going to get to say goodbye to people there. Pastor Marianne, are you, can you unmute yourself? That'd be awesome. Because um, this is the last morning sessions. We have a night session tonight for our uh, uh, family reunion. So we're finished with our uh, day sessions now. And I want to thank everybody for their participation there. And uh, so, um, Desi, you want to add anything in our farewell? It's just been a great time this morning. And I just want to thank everybody for hanging with us all week. And, you know, we've already said this is not the way we wanted to do family reunion, but I've just been so blessed this morning listening to all the speakers and got so much out of it and taken notes and pages of notes. So um, I just believe that, um, of course, that we'll be together next year. But I also believe that, um, you know, we've prayed, we've prayed about these meetings, we've prayed about this week, and that we can get what uh, the Holy Spirit needed us to get out of these meetings, even on Zoom, even on Facebook, um, you know, we can still receive the word into our hearts and it will make a difference in our lives. Amen. Well, thanks so much. Brother Jim, any parting words? No, I already <laughs> shared my party words. <laughs> yes, I really you did. I appreciate you were on fire. I saw some smoke coming off the screen there. You were on fire. It was, it was very much, very good. But I appreciate it. Everybody that took part in these meetings, I appreciate everybody that's taken the effort to tune in and watch and hear these meetings from your home. Some are doing it collectively in your churches. Uh, thank you for setting time aside to listen to all of these things, just as if you were here personally. The one big advantage that we have of doing it through YouTube and, and Facebook in the nighttime is that it's just not limited to AFCM members. It's good right. for the entire congregations and even people who are not part of AFCM. I believe the world can listen and benefit Amen. an entire congregation. So thank you all for making the effort to do that. Amen. Very good. Yeah, it's going to be archived. It can be watched and shared again. So let's do that with uh, the other members in our uh, association, our regions. And with that, we'll say farewell. God bless you. 
Uh, believe you're going to stay healed and whole. And uh, we'll see you, if not before, we'll see you in Wilmer next year. God bless. Amen. Amen. Amen.